I always get a little bit in trouble online when I talk about this because I think people can be so, you know, you just, you have a sort of worldview, you have a schema, you sort of filter things through that schema. And then when there's information that is presented that maybe opposes that framework, it can be for some who are not willing to sort of let new information in, it can be very activating for them. So I would love for you to talk about the difference here in protein quality when we're talking about animal proteins versus plant-based proteins. And I'd love for you to talk about this and you do so beautifully around the bioavailability and absorptability of some of these proteins and the differences sort of that lies within, like, sort of between the two camps. Yeah. So let's just start with the animal proteins. So animal proteins, we've talked about the essential amino acids, those nine and they're in very specific balances. We need about one gram of methionine. We need about six to seven grams of leucine. We need three grams of lysine. So we need, just like we need specific, you know, we need 60 milligrams of vitamin C. They're exact amounts. And it importantly, all animal proteins, whether it's meats or dairies or eggs or fish, have exactly the right balance for humans. Not surprisingly, plants have the exactly the right balance for plants. <laughs> plants make leaves and stems and roots and seeds and flowers, which are pretty different than brains and hearts and livers and, <laughs> and, and limbs, you know, arms. So uh, people need to understand that the plants aren't making proteins, amino acids for us. They're making them for themselves. And so they're not in the right balance. And you'll see proteins like quinoa will offer often advertise uh, that it has all the essential amino acids. Well, it does, but they're in the totally the right balance. And to get enough leucine to actually trigger, trigger muscle protein synthesis would require about seven cups of quinoa at a meal. So, you know, is quinoa a great food? It is, but it's actually a great carbohydrate food. It has a great fiber content. It has great nutrient content, but its protein's actually pretty crappy. Uh, you know, it just isn't very good. So, you know, I, I like to say, you know, things like things like chili are a perfect kind of food. You can have a, a meat in it. You can have your beans in it. You can have vegetables, onions, green pe peppers, tomatoes, whatever. It's a perfect blend of all of the different foods using both plant and animal foods to get the right balance. So the, the, the problem with plant is the amino acids are in the wrong balance. And then the other part of it, again, the amino acids are there for the plant so about 50% of those proteins are attached to fiber. They're part of the structural part of the plant. And humans don't digest fiber. And so the, the amino acids or the proteins that are in the plant aren't available to us. So when we see something like a whole grain cereal that says it, just for easy numbers, let's say it says it has 10 grams of protein in a serving, it's probably only 40% available. The bioavailability of protein from wheat, gluten, is very poor, probably about 40%. And so instead of having 10 grams in that serving, it only has four. So where animal proteins are 100% bioavailable, most plant proteins are somewhere between 40 and 60%. So when you see it has 10, at best, you're probably getting five out of it. So if a 55-year-old or 45 woman says, hey, I'm plant-based, I'm vegetarian, for whatever reason, I, you know, whether it's an ethical or economical or whatever environmental reason that they don't want to be consuming meats or animal-based proteins, they would by necessity need to consume more calories in order to sort of equate with the same physiological or metabolical consequences that we're talking here in a 45 or 55 year old woman who's consuming animal proteins, yes? Right, so you know, we've looked at vegetarian and vegan type of meals. The average vegetarian in the US is about 65 grams per day. The average vegan's around 55. We've done some modeling of looking at essential amino acid needs and what we know is that if you get below 
about 50% of your protein coming from animal protein, you can no longer meet your essential amino acid needs with a plant-based diet. So to your point, you have to increase both the total amount of protein, and that means the total calories. And so typically vegetarians and vegans decrease their protein when in fact they need to increase their total amount. So it's perfectly possible to be vegetarian or vegan, but you're going to have to have a lot of food knowledge about essential amino acids to balance that. You're going to have to either dramatically increase your calories or going to a lot of ultra processed foods where you're using isolated proteins to help keep the calories down. The problem in most plant-based pro, whether it's beans or, or seeds or nuts or whatever, your calorie ratio in, in beans and legumes, for example, you're going to get about three or four to one carb to protein ratio. So right. if you're trying to hit 100 grams of protein, you're going to get at least 300 grams of carbs, you know, which is 1,200 calories just in carbohydrates. So there's, it, there's just a lot of difficult problems, and it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it takes a lot of food knowledge and a lot of food skills to make that work. And again, the average adult in the U.S. doesn't have either the knowledge or the food skills to pull that off. So recommending it blindly that we all should have more plant-based diets might sound good, but that's a route to very poor adult health. I could not agree more. And maybe we'll, we'll put this on the shelf and see if we get to it in the time that we have today. But I would love to talk about things like the Beyond, the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger, all of these sort of fake meats as well. But I let's let's shelf that for a moment. So let's come back to vegetarians and vegans. So you said the vegetarians usually 60, like the on average you were looking at, they were taking in about 65 grams of plant-based proteins, vegans about 55 grams. Is there uh, a way that we can support these vegetarians and vegans? Like, would it be, you know, the bioavailability, for example, just knowing your work, I know that, you know, soy protein is more bioavailable. So would we, would we counsel them to maybe get like a powdered plant protein and then they're 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 instead of having the 65 or the 55 grams of plant proteins we can get them up to like 85 100 grams 120 grams with sure. sort of plant I, I, I mean your 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 statement is exactly right what to remember is that soy protein isn't unto itself novel if you eat it as edamame the right. avail bioavailability is only 60 percent or less but if you do process it and isolate it out as a plant, as a powder, a protein powder, then the bioavailability is up in the 90s. So now you have a, a you know a powder that you can use, and and you can make a shake or a product out of it. But again, you're now basically shifting from what we might say are natural foods to ultra processed foods to make that work. So the two things I would recommend to to vegetarians or vegans, or, or they do need to bring in some plant powders, and they also need to be very conscious of resistance exercise because their muscles are at risk because they're going to have a lower protein diet. And one of the ways you can increase the efficiency of the protein and also protect your muscles is with resistance exercise. So two things I always recommend is, you know, you need to be physically active, you need resistance exercise, you probably need a powders. And that's one of the reasons that most vegetarians are under the age of 40. The average right. vegetarian in the United States is between 20 and 40. Why? Because it's easier to be physically active and have these other products and eat more calories. It's very difficult for a 65 year old to be vegan. It's also illegal, I think, to raise your children as vegan. I think you are not allowed to do that because you run the risk of malnutrition. Uh, I mean, it should be, but growth. it's not in the United States, unfortunately. Yeah. I have heard of, um, I know in the UK there was, um, I think there was a child who died of malnutrition and the, the government or, you know, the country, I guess it would be the government ended up suing them for, for child, child neglect because yeah. you have I to mentioned give children. Yeah, I mentioned early in my career, I worked in Africa and childhood malnutrition. And one of yeah. the things we saw was, you know, children will survive on very poor diets, but they have very low muscle mass. 
And what that means is it predestines them to be obese. If you don't develop your muscle mass in your, you know, up to through your 25, 30 age, you can't develop it very well. It, it puts some limits on the maximum muscle mass you can get. And that's what you, I think you sort of alluded to it early. It's sort of skinny fat. Uh, and that's what we see in a country like India, where basically I think they're number two in the world in diabetes. But if you look at them, they all look fairly thin. And it's because they have almost no muscle mass. So they're what we call skinny fat. So they're extremely low in muscle. They're metabolically challenged. And they're very prone to insulin resistance and diabetes. It's, it's interesting too. I think we have lots of examples in history of this as well. I know the, my son is really into the world wars and, and European history. So we know, or at least he's told me about, and there's, there's documented evidence of this when the Germans had, uh, I think they had bombed, was it the Netherlands? And then they had sort of not allowed food to get into the country for whatever reason, there was some retaliation. I don't know the details of that, but the, that winter, there were so many, the women who were pregnant at that time ended up giving birth to these children who, you know, so the mother didn't get enough protein, the mother didn't get enough total calories. And, and with that, of course, total protein. And then their children, once those children were born, if they survived, all became obese, like without any, like 100% of them became obese. And so they, and they followed this sort of cohort of individuals over the course of their lives. And they always struggled with that. So what you're saying here, I think if I'm summarizing it and, and redirect me, if I'm, if I'm incorrect here, is even though in our youth, we are driven more by insulin and, and, and IGF-1, if you still don't meet a minimum requirement of protein intake, you are basically setting yourself up for sarcopenia and obesity to, together. Yeah, exactly. And again, their malnutrition in Africa, I think you're referring to the Stalingrad studies in, in Russia that came out of World War II. We see it in India. So we see it around the world that, you know, if you don't develop it correctly as a child, you go through those critical growth periods, uh, you can always add some muscle later in life but you're always limited sort of by your DNA. We call them satellite cells. Your DNA and muscle will always limit you. And I, I did some early studies that were animal studies during my PhD, actually. And we sort of demonstrated that, that there are critical growth periods. And if you don't establish that muscle potential, you're basically stuck with it for the rest of your life. Wow. Muscle potential. 